So moving on to tonight's lecture, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Richard Johnson, who is the Associate Professor of Materials Research Centre at Swansea University. Uh, since 2013, he's been a British Science Association Media Fellow uh, based on Nature, and in 2015, the Software Sustainability Institute Fellow. He embraces a multidisciplinary approach, and we have worked very closely with Richard uh, over the last, what, five, six, well, longer than five, six years, yeah, I think, longer. now, uh, with the many resources which he has down in the, uh, the Bay Campus, which we're very grateful for uh, his um, Cl collaboration with in order with working with these and tonight he's going to be presenting on mainly three of the objects which he's worked on three of our animal mummies um, by using various different technologies state-of-the-art technologies which we wouldn't usually have access to in order to really start to reconstruct the lives of these animals so I'm very much looking forward to this as I'm sure a lot of you are today so thank you very much Richard for agreeing to give this session and over well, thank you, Ken. Yeah, thanks for organising this, especially with the change in circumstances. And I think it's a really great thing, actually, to to run these as kind of more broad talks that are open, definitely more open to people around the world now. But it's kind of not fixed to a location. So yeah, it's it's a real privilege to to do. So thank you. Um, yeah. So as Ken said in the intro, I'm a material scientist and engineer. Um, so I know my bounds and. Uh, moving outside of those into looking at uh, ancient Egyptian artifacts um, is definitely out of my comfort zone and so it, I'll present throughout this that it's definitely a team effort um, and I'll show you the team uh, in a couple of slides that have been involved, people of various disciplines, um, all with kind of that same drive to collaborate. Um, so yeah, I'm based in Swansea University. I run an imaging facility, so we use various characterization techniques, uh, electron microscopy, x-ray, things like that, to usually study materials, um, whether they're human-made, engineering materials, biological materials, and in this case, heritage, uh, museum artifacts as well. That's a slide, oh, there we go. So the team, I'll introduce you to the team and I'll, I'll refer back to it at the end as well. And this will run kind of like a timeline as Ken said, uh, yeah, we've been working together for quite some time with the Egypt Center. Uh, back to 2013 was the first time I, I scanned one of these samples. But yeah, over the years, it's included Jack Christie, who was an undergraduate material science and engineering student at Swansea University. Um, Becky Bolton, who is now a postdoctoral researcher at Swansea, but at the time she was looking at animal mummies, she was um, again an undergraduate material student. Um, We've also got Dr. Rhys Jones from Cardiff University, who's a bioscientist and herpetologist. Professor Richard Thomas from University of Leicester, who's a zoo archeologist. Dr. Laura North, who's a material scientist and then a data scientist. And most importantly, Dr. Carolyn Graves-Brown and Wendy Goodridge from the Egypt Center, who uh, without them, none of this would have existed because I kind of knocked on their door and, and they were open to chatting and, and seeing what we could do together with x-rays and, and their, their samples. It's really important because we're working with uh, mummified animal samples that are from a particular region. So throughout anything we do, any outputs, it's important that we res respectfully acknowledge the people of ancient Egypt who created these artifacts uh, from that region, um, particularly as we're in the West and we're, you know, we have these in our museums and we, we're studying them. So it's really important to, to acknowledge the region and the people. Um, and if you haven't looked at animal mummies in the past, um, many of you will, by the sounds of it, from the chat at the start, you'll understand and have a huge insight into animal mummies. But for those who've never come across them, um, if you're potentially in engineering like I was and, and you find out through chatting to Carolyn that there are these amazing things and there are millions of them, um, these are actually created at, during that time. Um, and you'll see a name that pops up throughout the slides. Uh, it's Salima Ikram, so you can see the reference at the bottom. So Salima is the kind of world authority on animal mummies and she's divided them into six separate categories. So these are often mummified remains, sometimes not, but effectively can be divided up into these six categories. So it could be potentially pets buried with their owner, could be victual mummies, so potentially as food as the uh, person moves into the afterlife, could be sacred animals which were worshipped during their lifetime, so there are examples of those in various museums, 
or votive, votive offerings um, placed with the person and within the temple um, as offerings to the gods. There are definitely some that are described as false or amalgam. So when some animal mummies have been studied, then there may not actually be any remains in there, no animal remains. Um, and then uh, conveniently a sixth category of other because it's good to leave it open for some, <laughs> there are millions of these and so we might find something that is outside of those categories. So we're really going to focus on uh, some votive offerings uh, that were from the Egypt Centre collection at Swansea. So votive offerings date back to um, 672 BC and on to the 4th century AD. And as I mentioned so far, there were potentially millions, up to 70 million animal mummies produced and created at that time. Um, and we come across them, there are, there are animal mummies in museums around the world, lots of them, mostly in stores because there's so many. Um, and for votive offerings, they were given to gods and there were certain animals, so certain animal mummies that would be acceptable to specific gods. And so there is a huge range, birds, mammals, fish, reptiles, that um, have been evidenced um, in museum collections. And to imagine over that period up to around 70 million of these being produced. So that we're really talking about an industry, industry, industrial scale rearing, but also the mummification processes. So to actually create a mummified animal is quite intensive. And so I know Salim has been looking at this. So Professor Salim Ekram has been looking at the type of society and the infrastructure that would have to be around that type of industrial scale processing. Um, and so you start to imagine, you know, it gives you numbers of one thing, you know, 70 million of these things and x-rays that show you the insides, but actually what, why are we doing this? It's to try and understand the society and, and the people of that time. And so, yeah, I mentioned Salima, so Professor Salima Ikram. So I would check out the work of both Salima Ikram and Dr. Lydia McKnight at Manchester University, Professor Salima Ikram's at um, American University of Cairo. And so their work is brilliant. So looking at animal mummies, experts in animal mummies, also on x-ray and radiography of animal mummies as well. So as I said, I'm just an engineer working with people who work in this area and I x-rayed some things, but actually if you, there's a load of work that comes before this um, and technology has kind of moved us on to, to be able to look at them in, in more depth and higher resolution. So definitely check out the work of um, those two brilliant academics. As I mentioned, my bounds are imaging, engineering, materials, and x-ray vision. Normally I'd be applying that to yeah, jet engine materials or a manufacturing plant or for bio-inspiration to look at you know, the, the cuticle of an insect to see if there's something we can design uh, in a human wave world inspired by that. Um, and so imaging, Imaging has changed the understanding of, of mummies, animal mummies and human. So since around the 1800s, people were starting to investigate mummified remains and it would often be quite destructive and intrusive. So it would involve physical unwrapping of samples to reveal desiccated remains. And when things are desiccated and dry, you get movement when you disturb them. Um, so the development of X-ray imaging has been incredibly useful, really helpful actually for both human and animal mummies because you can have this non-destructive uh, method for seeing inside a mummy without unwrapping it. So it can, it could be a, you know, a display mummified animal or human in a museum and you can take that and you can scan that and you can take it back and put it back on display and you can gain a lot of insight in the process while it's still able to be viewed as is or as it was at the time. So initially people used medical x-ray CT. So this is really similar to what you, you would find in a hospital. Often it is in hospitals that mummified remains have ended up being scanned. Um, and so anyone who's had a medical x-ray CT scan will know much like that. Uh, I can get the pen, uh, laser pointer. Much like this mummy here. So that's a human mummy has been scanned and you can reveal all the skeletal structure um, within. Um, that would be the same process as for a live human. So going inside you know, a big tube CT scanner, you stay stationary or the mummy stays stationary. And in that tube around you is a spinning X-ray um, source and opposite is a detector. And they just spin around you really, really fast to gather through the images. And that's also historically been applied to 
animal mummies. So this is an example of a bird mummy that was put through a medical CT scanner. And that's good. Um, you can get really insightful imaging, particularly on a human mummy, because it's, it's actually quite massive. You know, we're talking about the size of a human plus a little bit extra. Um, but for animal mummies, which are a lot smaller, actually the resolution isn't, isn't as good. And so it's hard to pick up some details and gain as much insight because the package is smaller and it's made for humans. So we use something called X-ray microtomography. And the only real difference is in, in that the specimen doesn't stay stationary, it rotates. Um, but our source and our detector for the X-rays, they're not moving there. Uh, stationary around the specimen and the key thing is we have higher power and we get higher resolution so we can see some of those smaller features that you wouldn't typically see with a medical CT scanner so we can go from this package on the left of your screen so that's a mummified animal potentially but it just looks like kind of a ball of rags so the actual size of that is a bit smaller than my head then with x-rays we can see the middle image so we can see there's something in there we can see a snake in this particular example, and that's a 2D X-ray. So that's the type of thing, if you would go to hospital and you have your arm X-rayed because it's broken, you get a two dimensional flat image. With X-ray microtomography, then we have this 3D aspect to it because rather than just imaging the stationary object, the object spins and we take thousands and thousands of images and we rebuild those into this 3D view up here. So that's kind of the key difference. And that's the underpinning technology for what I'll, I'll talk about. This is the last slide on X-ray CT technology and I kind of covered it anyway, but effectively, yeah, there's the difference. We create X-rays in a cone, our sample rotates 360 degrees and we get lots and lots of these individual projections. Uh, so it'd be the equivalent of the X-rays coming out of the, <clears throat> the camera that's filming me. I'd be rotating and that would generate one 3D volume that we can then analyze and interrogate. So why, why would we, you know, this machine is, is pretty massive. Um, why would we put a mummified animal in there? So I talked about preservation, so it's non-destructive. So you get to see the insides of things that without physically unwrapping them. But ultimately, the reason we're doing it, we, we're just using a tool. Technology provides us with tools, and this is, this is a step on from medical CT. So we now have a new tool to study animal remains and hopefully reveal those hidden stories of the past. So what within there, what inside that we've never seen before in thousands of years can help us learn more about the past, the people and the animals of the past. Also, you need curiosity, I guess. You don't have an x-ray machine without having curiosity because now, you kind of look at everything and think, I wonder what it looks like inside. Um, as long as it's not living, it can go inside our x-ray machine. And so this was my lab back in 2013. So when I started out, I got this x-ray machine. Um, I was on the other campus, Singleton University campus, and right opposite engineering was the Egypt Center. So I had this x-ray machine. I was doing loads of stuff with um, jet engine manufacturers and um, plane manufacturers, steel manufacturers, and then I thought, well, every day I pass this Egypt Center Museum. I'd already done a project with um, Professor Kasia Spagowska on um, clay cobra figurines, on breaking them, because that's, that's kind of what material scientists like to do, is break things. Um, and so she introduced me to Dr. Carolyn Graves-Brown, um, and she wandered me through the stores uh, in the Egypt Center, as well as the kind of more public facing aspects. And we just looked for things to x-ray at that point. Again, it was someone who was also embracing curiosity. So there's Caroline and Wendy in the lab, in the old lab, I'm not there anymore. Um, and I'll come back to this map of the Egypt Center later um, for a reason. Um, and so the Egypt Center, you know, got all of these wonderful artifacts and I was able to go around there thinking, what would x-ray be useful for here? What additional insight could it provide? And so we, we, we ended up on some animal remains and human remains. Um, oh yeah. So now I've moved away. So we're, we're just down the road at a brand new campus. So I started off with that one extra machine in that lab in 2013 when this project started. Um, it's been a slow burner mainly because it's kind of one of those side projects. Um, and since then I've set up um, a bigger imaging facility. So not just having one x-ray machine. 
So that was one tool. Now these are the tools I have that we can apply to different um, challenges in engineering and in things like heritage and archaeology as well. So lots of different instruments to do lots of different characterization. But we still fall back on x-ray for this particular um, example. So the keys to this were curiosity, first of all, kind of having a team who is curious and, and you know, wants to know more about um, specimens that are in the museum or in the store and, who wants, and from the x-ray side wanting to see what the x-rays can reveal. Um, yeah, it's quite fascinating having an x-ray machine. Every time you scan something, you, you know you're probably the first person in the world to see the inside of that. Or in the example of museum specimens, the first person for thousands of years to see the inside. So yeah, it's um, quite gratifying in that sense. So curiosity is important. Interdisciplinarity is really, really important. So as I said, I have bounds to my knowledge. Um, to work interdisciplinary in an interdisciplinary way um, allows me to say I don't know a lot because it's acceptable to not know what you know, things in Egyptology, but the key is then to work with people who do know. And so working with um, archaeologists, Egyptologists, then kind of we combine and have bring each of our knowledge together and, and work. And then the characterization tools, really important as well. So it started with the snake. That was the first thing. So the example I used to describe microtomography, we have um, this example. So Carolyn showed me this in the stores. Um, just this little bundle. Actually, I think this was on display. Um, and they'd had it actually x-rayed at a vet uh, prior to this. So this was in 2013. And before that, they'd had it x-rayed. So that image you can see here isn't my x-ray image. That's from the vet. And it's a 2D image, but it shows it, there's something in there. So it actually contains an animal and quite clearly contains a snake wrapped up and coiled within this. And there's some things you can learn from that 2D image. Um, but you could probably look at the length, you could get a, a rough estimate of the length and maybe a prediction of the age, but the species and things like that would be really difficult. Um, and so that's where it started. So this is when I put it in our machine over in engineering. Um, so the x-ray looks very similar, the 2D x-ray. Um, you can see the head just around there. But then the 3D view really gives us something new compared to that 2D x-ray. So this is from the 3D data, this is a rendering of that. And so the key now, to understand animal mummies, we're not dissecting and unwrapping, we're digitally doing that. So this is digital unwrapping of an animal mummy. So we can get a lot more information from this. So now we can see that 3D snake in, in its configuration within that bundle and we can start to, start to interrogate that for more understanding, try and think, what does it tell us about this snake's life and the moments of its death? Um, so this was the first scan. It was okay. It's pretty good. Um, and there's a still image showing kind of the digi digital dissection. So from that we saw a few things, but I think I scanned a couple more artifacts. And, and as I said, it was a side project. I had lots of other things going on. So it was kind of on the back burner for a while. Um, we had the data, it looked nice. I showed lots of people and, and the Egypt Center were able to do that as well. But then in, later in 2013, I happened to be at uh, a meeting in, in Cardiff um, and Dr. Rhys Jones from Cardiff University was, was, was kind of almost um, giving us some training on the media because uh, he had this show, Rhys Jones' Wildlife Patrol. He's also a bioscientist and a herpetologist uh, studying snakes. Um, and he was telling us about his show, Reese Jones' Wildlife Patrol, which is, um, he gets called to wildlife emergencies around Wales, um, and often that might include snakes as well. Um, and so he finished talking and there was a coffee break and I just started chatting to him and you know, mentioned, oh, we've, there's a snake inside this mummified package in the Egypt Centre that we've, we've x-rayed. Um, there's not much else, for, you know, Egyptologists and material scientists snakes aren't our expertise and so you know he, <laughs> he was instantly interested um and uh, dr jones you know like the the famous uh, movie uh archaeologist was then interested and came down to swansea as part of his tv show and we filmed the process of showing him the data taking him inside this mummified package to see what was in there and instantly like that we gained new insight so we we created this 3D image, it was quite cool, looked nice, we'd learnt a little bit, but actually we needed different expertise. That's what collaboration is. And so Reese brought different expertise. 
And so instantly we started to look at things like the cause of death. Um, we'd seen this before, but we didn't, you know, we don't work with snakes. Um, and so this is a zoomed in view of the, the overall scan. And we can see clear separation of the vertebra, um, kind of around halfway along the length of the snake, um, which was interesting to us, but to Reese, he instantly, he knows uh, throughout the world, there are ways of that people use to dispatch of snakes, to kill snakes, um, even in modern times. And one of the methods is almost like using it like a bull whip. So you crack, you hold the snake in the tail and you crack, crack the whip in it and it separates vertebrae, effectively killing the snake. And it's, it's yeah, he's seen it used and, and is aware of that. And we weren't aware of that. And so at that instant, as soon as we were looking at that data, we've gained potentially new insight. So we've got a possible cause of death, um, which again gives us insight into practices used at that time, potentially thousands of years ago, and how those practices still remain um, in different parts of the world right now. So that was kind of the first exciting um, bit. Um, then, as I said, in 2013, we were using x-rays conventionally. And so even though I described this as a side project and a collaboration, actually this changed a little bit of the way we used our x-ray machine as well, because the resolution of that overall package scan wasn't quite good enough to, to give us um, the skull morphology and to look at species. And so we started to experiment with different ways of scanning. And there's this perceived wisdom and papers on this, um, that the whole thing needs to be in the field of view for scanning. And we were following that for years. Uh, well, not for years, maybe a couple of years. Um, but we wanted to zoom in on, on this. We knew where it was, looking at 2D images, but we wanted to zoom in on the skull. And so we moved that closer to the source and you could see outside of the cone of x-rays, you'd see some of the specimen that would come in and out of the field of view. And it was assumed that you couldn't really image with that, but, but we did and we managed to get really, really good data. So now you can see a higher resolution data set of just that skull and the change between the previous scan and this one in terms of the detail that we got from that was a game changer again. And we did this because we were with Reese and he asked, could we look at the skull to help him identify the species? Um, and then when we did that, we realized there's loads of damage. So this skull has been, uh, been through a lot. Um, there's one side of the, the mandible is missing. So the left hand side is there, the right hand isn't. Uh, the right eye socket is damaged and broken, you'll see. And so we saw this damage. Those bones weren't in the rest of the mummified package. And so that tells us this damage happened before it was mummified or before it was included in wrappings because they aren't, those bones aren't anywhere to be found in this, this complete package. And so that gave us some insight that must have happened around the time of mummification um, before, before it was mummified. And so again, potentially some insight into either around the time of death or just after part of the process of mummification afterwards as quite a damaging process. So yeah, this skull view was, was what Reese needed to be able to look at the, and some measurements of the skull as well to compare to um, museum specimens. And we were able to, we were able to from that identify the species as an Egyptian cobra. Um, you can look, you know, we can use evidence and look at right, what snakes would have been around that region at the time. Um, that coupled with measurements and CT data allow us to then get a, get a, a firm idea of what species this snake was and, and looking at the overall size as well. Um, during this process as well, I'd ignored these for a few years. This is more recent um, because we were writing up a paper on this and 3D data is quite large. Even that, um, that high res scan might be of a small area. So the skull of this snake, just to give you some perspective, the length of the skull from the tip here to the back is about 15 millimeters. So about the size of my thumbnail. So really small, it's a small snake. Um, but we're getting that type of detail on the scan. But yeah, these features, are, this is the thing I've done most research on with the snake. So I had to delve into papers that are in very um, disparate areas away from my own. Um, but what we think this is, so you can see these uh, features here. I'll go back to this one. I've colored them green in segmentation, but what we think those are, are um, calcified kidneys. Um, which when you look through kind of veterinary papers um, and things like that, um, snakes can actually be dehydrated. So if they're not given water, if they're in captivity, then you can get 
Um, they can form like a, a type of gout, um, which can calcify their kidneys. And so these showed up in x-ray years, thousands of years later, because they're almost as dense as bone, the kidneys, because they've had calcium um, secreted into them. Um, so rather than just kind of dis drying out and disappearing over time, they're very stark, very obvious within that um, structure. So again, that gives us insight into potentially the way it was kept when it was alive. So to be dehydrated, if, if we've got 70 million animal mummies, they're being reared for this purpose. It's a young snake, it's quite small. Um, it's possible that it was kept in conditions without water or much water um, that led to this type of um, pathology. And again, years after the initial scan, probably about 2017, 2018, so years after I got that initial data, um, I was looking at all the things around the mouth then to try and, try and get an understanding of what was going on inside there. And notice these two, two you see the yellow um, parts here. So they're inside the mouth. I hadn't really put them into context before because they're quite dense. So these two dense uh, yellow things inside, they're really small, about the size of a grain of rice in, um, in, to put it into perspective, but really, really small. Um, and when I went through the slice data, so that's individual slices of the x-ray, you can see they're very precisely placed at the opening of the throat. So uh, the glottis in a, in a snake. So they're, they're very precisely placed potentially. Um, and if you look through literature, then uh, mouths were packed with uh, drying material to try and desiccate mummified animals before wrapping. But these are very, very small. You wouldn't get much desiccation effect from these. And they seem very, because uh, the, the actual soft tissue potentially shows up in the x-ray as well as dried and desiccated. So we could see that they were placed um, right at the opening of the mouth. Oops, <laughs> insert the video. Um, and so to try and understand what they were without unwrapping, um, we thought we'd do a little bit of experimental archaeology. So when I talk about a slice, this is from the data. If you took one individual slice out, like a slice of bread, you take it out to the whole volume and just look at that slice. This is a slice that shows both these are the things that we found inside the mouth. That's the jawbone, that's some of the vertebra. Uh, they're the calcified kidneys, um, but they all have the similar grayscale level. And then this is wrappings. This is the, the material that it's wrapped in. Um, and so we know it has this kind of brightness, which is related to its density. And so what we did, we created a sample out of, we, we looked at the literature and what type of things potentially would you find in the mouth? That might give us indication of why it's in there, if it's part of a ritual potentially, or if it's just the type of stuff that they would have around as part of a mummification process. Um, and so we scanned in the same scan, so you had the relative grayscale of bone, natron, and myrrh. I had to order some myrrh off eBay to do this, to create this specimen. Um, but from that, we can see bone and natron are very similar in their gray value. Myrrh is very different, looks completely different. And so when we compare that to our original slice data, we've got bone there, natron there with these cracks and, and um, bright spots as well, which is a high density particle. So that relative grayscale indicates it's potentially natron, which has been um, documented as, as being a material used to desiccate um, in mummified animals, but also in some examples used as a very specific um, ritualistic procedure called the opening of the mouth procedure. Um, for mummified animals and humans. So this being placed right at the opening of the glottis could be indicative of that. It's hard to say definitely with any of this because we're just trying to provide as much evidence with the techniques available to us, but it could be that it's indicative of more ritualistic procedures being carried out on this mummified snake. And just for interest as well, I talked about bone shows up really well over time, you know, thousands of years potentially later, but also we've got some soft tissue that's completely desiccated and still showing up. So on these slice data here, you can see that very round um, structure that is effectively cut through. That's a slice through the eye of the snake because it's on the one side, the other side was too damaged. Uh, so you lost a lot of bone, so the eye is missing. Um, but effectively we've got a desiccated retained eye, which is really interesting that you still see that this far um, after it's been dead and dried out and, and stored for for many years. So this is a virtual reality view. This is only in the last like six months now. As I talk about technology moving on, 
this is data that I generated in 2013, but now the software is allowing me to do new things. And so with this virtual reality, I could be completely immersed inside this mummified snake skull. I could make it as big as my house. And then I can start to see new features and new placement of things and where those mouth inserts are um, to start to gain um, even more insight. So this is data that's living on almost as long as um, the mummified animal remains are. And you can see I can switch on and off those mouth inserts and the, uh, the calcified kidneys as well and segment them out in different colors so they become clearer to see. Um, so this is really cool and very good for outreach and engagement as well, but, but actually useful for us as part of our analysis workflow. And the other thing we've done as well, we did this many years ago, was to 3D print from that initial low resolution scan. So that's a bit of the skull and the vertebra, really kind of low res you can see, um, but that's been in the Egypt Center for a number of years next to the package. So that allows people that glimpse inside um, while still they see the outside of the wrappings. Um, and then there's the scaled up version of the skull. So that's about as big as my own skull. We've been able to print that. Um, and again, that was, that was really useful for Reese when trying to identify species as well. So you can, you can run your thumb along one of the ridges and, and get a real feel for that. So that skull is as big as, uh, that snake skull is as big as mine. And the real one is as big as my thumbnail. So actually what we're doing here is better than if we'd physically dissected out the bones. We get we can scale it up and, and you, all those features are magnified to try and understand what species that might be. So here are the things we learned um, from the snake over the last seven years. We think we've got a possible cause of death um, with the whipping, possible conditions while alive that it was kept. So we've got this calci calcified kidneys, um, which could be indicative of the conditions it was kept in that whole mummification industrial processing. Um, indication of the mummification processes with the wrappings around there, but also some of the materials that we found in the mouth. We can identify the species pretty confidently um, and then potential ritualistic behavior, um, which we think, you know, if as we study more and more snake mummies, maybe we'll look out for this type of, uh, this type of um, configuration within the mouth. They're very small, so they could be missed. They were missed on the lower resolution scan. So that's the snake mummy. Move on to the next one, which is a bird. So we, we're going to cover snake, bird, and finally a cat. Um, so this, I describe it as a suspected bird because until it's x-rayed, then you're never sure. Um, particularly with this, it's covered in kind of a resinous material. Um, the, the indication that it's a bird are its beak was broken, but at least you could see some of the beak and there looks a fractured leg bone sticking out of the bottom. Um, but again, a good candidate for x-ray imaging to see what we can see. And once x-rayed and 3D, um, through 3D market tomography, this is what we could see. So actually a really intact um, mummified bird, apart from the bits that were essentially protruding out of the, the protective um, resin that was protecting the bones and the structure. So yeah, we could see that. And now we're into the same process. What can we learn? from this, this mummified animal. We found a few fractures um, in some of the bones, but nothing that was um, particularly, uh, not like the, the separated vertebra of the, the snake, anything indicating cause of death. Um, uh, yeah. And so that was kind of about it for the, for the mummified bird. I will come on to some of the other things we saw as well, but yeah, that was the initial kind of, look, we, we knew it was a bird, we knew there were the kind of mummified remains, nothing really to, to warrant any further kind of zooming in to look at parts. Um, and then we move on to, again, suspected cat. This one particularly because there were no protruding bones or parts, and there is a history of mummified cat um, artifacts actually containing no, no bones, or bones that aren't cats even, or maybe one or two bones. Um, and so suspected cat up until this point, where we were able to x-ray image it. And we do see within those wrappings, there's a full um, cat skull within there. And so this is the slice data. This was really interesting again, but it was kind of early days. We, we just did a scan and, and the first thing we see is this type of data. Um, and you see as you slice through the skull, so this would be an eye socket kind of, 
the skull is full of bits of bone. Um, and in isolation, as a material scientist, engineer, x-raying things, and the Egypt Center, we're, we're quite excited. We think, oh, crikey, maybe this is, you know, this damage is being caused at the moment of death or around the time of death, because this is the cochlea part of the year that is fully into the skull. When you're looking in the other plane, so cutting this way, side on, you can see there's a whole chunk of the skull missing here, and it's actually all resting over here with some of the um, desiccated brain matter and some of the, the linen wrappings as well. So a very damaged skull. So it's no longer a suspected cat at this point. So again, we showed this to Reese. Um, Reese is a herpetologist, so had some thoughts on it, but we didn't really do any more after that point. Um, we just kind of showed that initial data, um, and that was it for a good while. Um, and we just had that data. We didn't do anything else with it. And then Carolyn came over to, this is coming through the fire of engineering with a mummified dog in a box. Um, just a normal day for us. Um, and so she's wandering in with what this dog from the, the stores. Actually, the dog didn't really work out for us. It was, it was a bit too large for our scanners, and that would actually suit a uh, medical scanner better. Um, but the big difference was um, Dr. Beverly Rogers, who lots of you will know, blogged about this process, and that's where this picture comes from. Um, so, you know, it's the day the dog went over to engineering for, for X-ray, taking the dog for a walk. Um, and then six months later, BBC Horizon saw Beverly's blog about taking this dog for a walk um, and got in touch because they were, they were doing a documentary called 70 Million Animal Mummies. Um, they were working with Salima, working with Lydia, who I mentioned before, uh, and some other people, and they'd seen that we were doing micro CT on animal uh, mummies, and that was, again, a different aspect that other people weren't doing, and so they, they wanted to come and, and discuss this. Um, but they said they actually, they'd been in touch with a, a zoo archaeologist, so Professor Richard Thomas at University of Leicester, um, who, again, was another missing piece of the cog, really. We didn't have um, anyone with that expertise that could potentially look at these broken bones of the cat skull and try and piece together what happened around that time of death or was it afterwards um, in the thousands of years since. And so another collaboration was born uh, and this was um, catalyzed by a BBC production crew um, bringing academics together to work together on um, a challenge where we had the data but we just didn't have the skills to interpret that. And so we came together for that program. They were most interested in the cat mummy um, and so we did a little more high resolution imaging, um, worked remotely with uh, Richard in Leicester, um, effectively trying again to piece together the life and the death of this cat from the x-ray data and the remains. It was kind of difficult to do remotely. 3D data is, is big. Um, an example I would talk about, you know, the, the amount of data you get from one x-ray scan is about the same as the amount of data for a whole like PlayStation game, like Grand Theft Auto, and people can walk around that city for months seeing new things. And it's kind of the same with, with x-ray data. You can look at different length scales and you see new things. But to do that remotely and just send images, it's kind of tricky. The best way is to show someone the 3D data or a 3D print. Uh, so we interrogated that data over the, the coming period um, and saw some other things that started to look interesting. So I scanned it years before. Um, the data was sat there, we'd look at it every once in a while, but again, someone with the new skills were able to then take that further. Um, and we also realized we're the first people in the world to really be looking at it at this scale. So zooming into particular features to tell us more rather than just doing an overall scan. Uh, so a little bit more now about this no longer suspected cat mummy. Um, it was donated to the Egypt Center in 97 um, from the University of Aberyst with, um, I think with a bunch of other specimens as well. Um, the history prior to that is kind of difficult to piece together. Um, here's what the raw x-ray projections looked like. That first time we put this specimen in, so instantly you can see pretty much as soon as you put it in, you, you, it's quite clearly got some remains in there and, and they were a, a skull. Um, what was the surprise when we first put it in was how much wrapping there was. And so it's quite a small skull within what was a small mummified head. Um, and the years that the, the kind of um, display years that are on there quite lifted quite far away from the skull as well. 
And so again, we've got a digital unwrapping of the mummified cat. So this cat again is as it looked um, in the museum before we scanned it. You've got, you, you could pick out actually all the kind of weave of that wrapping. You can count the number of layers of the wrapping. Uh, but as we pass through, we're able to remove those digitally and we're left with the skull. And you can kind of start to see some of the damage in this image. And you can see a lot of the material. There's the biggest kind of hole in the, the cranium, which a lot of that removed bone then is inside the, the brain casing, inside the skull. And once we have that information, um, we can do lots of things visually. We can kind of spin around and look at it, but actually we can just this view with a really kind of dark shadowing effect shows up cracks and fractures quite well. So the lower mandible, you can see there's um, big cracks there. Lots and lots of damage effectively. And as, as I said, as a non-expert, I thought, oh crikey, this, this cat has met a horrible end. Um, it's been you know, bashed around the head to, to dispatch it as part of this you know, industry of mummification where uh, you don't tend to let animals live live out their life and then mummify them. There's got to be a process that intervenes with that. Uh, and then we can produce something like this from the data. So it was quite a small skull, but we're able to zoom in and, and get actually inside the skull around all those bone fragments to try and piece together what happened. Um, and also into what's left of um, the vertebra as well. So we can fly through the eye socket. This is a video we create, but when we're interrogating the data, obviously we can spin it around and look at the skull from the inside out to gain new insight. So as I said, we, we scanned it in 2013, started to look at it again during the Horizon kind of work in 2015. And believe it or not, even since that Horizon episode, what I'm going to show you now is, is kind of new. So all of the, the stuff I'm about to show you didn't even really make it into Horizon because since then we've interrogated the data even more. Um, Oh, firstly, looking at the damage. So these are some still images. You can see complete loss of the side of the skull there. Fractured upper mandible, um, really quite damaged. Fractured lower mandible, uh, radiating across both. Um, and then in the virtual reality, again, we can start to look at this data um, in 3D space. And virtual reality does add an immense amount. Otherwise, you're looking at 3D data on a 2D screen. Um, being able to immerse yourself in there and, and kind of scale it up. It's almost like a touch screen. You just pull these apart and it grows, like pulling apart two fingers on a touch screen. So you make this in three dimensions much bigger and you can start to go through that. Um, we can segment bits to highlight where bones would have been and, and where they've ended up. Um, damage from the top, we can segment this, uh, ready for 3D printing. And then this, this was the key really. So this is where most of the damage of those bone fragments came from. And so when Richard in Leicester was looking at this, again, it changed. So expertise changed our perspective on this. So I thought, you know, crikey, that would be a way of killing this cat. But actually Richard showed that this is the type of failure or the cracks that you get in bone way after something is dried out. So way after something's dead, these kind of sharp fractures, bone is, is a relatively wet material when something's, alive or near the time of being alive and you don't get these types of fractures typically and so all of this damage nearly all of the damage that we're seeing is post mummification in the hundreds to thousands of years since um, which was really interesting actually so we've gone from thinking oh we might know how this this poor cat was was killed to be mummified but now we've gone to actually we've learned more about what's happened to it since because the wrappings, the wrappings looked pristine. You, you saw the x-ray data and the image of the sample, yet the damage to the inside of that, the skull, um, has been caused at some point years after once it's dried out. So there's lessons to be learned there in terms of um, storage and conservation and, and you know, learning from the bones that everything isn't, or potentially not always something that's happened at the time. Um, but from this data, uh, again, Richard picked out that there was actually this really interesting separation at the base of the skull onto the, the vertebra, um, and quite a significant separation as well. And so at that point, we identified this potentially, this is potentially the cause of death. Again, this is a very small skull, um, so it's, you know, it's, it's a young cat, um, so it's 
it's likely that it was part of this industrialized mummification process. And so you end up with, you know, you have to effectively kill a cat to create this animal mummy. Um, and the, the literature has shown some examples of cats being effectively strangled to create animal mummies. And so we think we found a mark of four strangulation again in another animal mummy um, specimen. Um, so they're displaced and dislocated, which would have potentially killed the cat at this time. Um, again, it's difficult to say for definite, but we can just provide evidence that suggests, link that into previous research, which has shown it was a method that was used at the time with other specimens. And we found another marker with high resolution imaging. So it can be useful for future when people are categorizing the ways in which animal mummies were killed at the time. So this is a virtual reality view of the body. The body was separate, um, but weirdly, the, the body is a lot larger than the head, but there was nothing particularly remarkable in, in the sample. Um, the tail was tucked between its hind legs and, and up uh, its body. Um, its, its forelimbs were kind of tucked back along its body and the hind limbs were bent and tucked in. So it was just how do you create a small, tightly bound package with the limbs and tail? Um, but no clear breakages, no, no foul play, no damage, no interesting mummification procedures of the internal um, cavities either. Um, so we moved on, we focused really on the skull in the, in the last few years. And so this is, this is since Horizon. Um, we were trying to determine the age of the cat and it was a bit confusing at times. And it was only when I went really back into the data, like at a micron level, I started to go through the bones and try, I was trying to measure the teeth, send some measurements to Richard in Leicester. And I noticed that I described the teeth as missing actually, which we thought was part of the damage. It was only when I went inside the bone, these little red teeth here, they're unerupted. Um, so, and that's indicative of a very young cat then, um, within maybe six to eight weeks of life. Um, those teeth might erupt um, and so they were still within the cavity within the, the mandible just about to come out and so we could actually um, put a, an accurate um, age to this cat when it, when it did die um, and so we've by identifying those hidden teeth which I hadn't seen for about five or six years of having this data and it's only when I kind of sliced into the mandible to try and get an accurate measurement of the other teeth that we realized the teeth weren't missing at all they just hadn't erupted from the mandible yet. So we were able to yeah, accurately put an age to this. So effectively is a very young kitten, and now we have a, an age and potential cause of death. So you know, we're looking at potential kitten strangling at this point to create an animal one. And in virtual reality again, I'll show you that process of slicing through when I was trying to do a measurement. So we can slice through there and that's when it reveals the tooth isn't missing at all. It was sitting within the bone this whole time. So we're, Again, you, you look at data again and you start to see new things. So yeah, we've got this possible cause of death of strangulation. We've got the age at the time of death, it was definitely a kitten. Um, we know that the damage is post mummification damage. Um, and we also have species identification from some of those measurements that I talked about. So um, effectively it was a common cat. Um, and so yeah, those measurements allowed us to do that from the skull. So we learned a lot from, from the cat data um, over about, I'd say six, six to seven years, um, incrementally learning more and more by interrogating the x-ray data at different um, levels and getting deeper into it and then applying new software like the virtual reality to, to try and find new things. Um, oh yeah, and finally I'll just revert back to the bird. So I think the snake and the, the cat are the, probably the most interesting because they have these extra insight that um, we got from either doing higher resolution scans or um, new interrogation years later. Maybe I should probably put the bird into VR and, and see if there's anything that I've missed. But um, at the moment, we can identify the fracture to the leg, which is protruding from the bottom. Um, we can see, this is interesting. I, so we've got um, preservation of lung tissue, this spongy, thing within the chest cavity. So it's amazing that that's retained over this, this length of time. And so this is slices through again. And then here, these oval or circular structures there, slices through the feathers. Um, so we're showing you the feather structure. Um, uh, yeah, I say it wasn't as interesting as the other two, but we did a lot of work on 
trying to work out what species of bird. So we looked at there's tons of literature on birds of, of modern Egypt and birds of ancient Egypt. Um, lots of birds have been mummified. So there's loads of examples in museums where people have either done some radiology or some dissection. Um, you can see the trachea there is, is preserved as well. Um, oh, bird video. It didn't come in. It didn't play. Um, so myself and Reese, we had to go to National Museums Wales in Cardiff to look at some. We had all of the bone measurements effectively. Um, and there are some resources online, some useful resources, but there's nothing better than getting hands on with some skeletons. And so we did, we compared those measurements and, and some of the real intricacies of bone morphology to some of the, the samples that were in National Museums, Wales, Cardiff. Um, here's the measurements from the CT. So again, all these measurements, pretty accurate, um, based on the 3D data from x-ray. You know, these bones weren't removed, but we were able to measure them in all the kind of correct placements and get the right morphology. And it was those that we compared to samples uh, and tables of data online. Um, and from that, we compared to the ones that you would expect to be in Egypt. And the most likely um, one that ticked most of the boxes in bold for all of these uh, different measurements was the Eurasian kestrel. Um, and that has been seen in mummified birds before as well. So that gives you confidence in our, um, in our interrogation and measurements and and understanding. So yeah, it's most likely Eurasian kestrel um, from the data. So the findings from that mummification process we looked at with the resin and how thick that was. We got the species from it and we also can you know, staggering level of preservation of some of the really soft, tiny, thin wall tissues like the lungs. Uh, so that's been really useful as well. Um, and so it's been an interesting project, very different. The paper from it, I've talked about it plenty of times, it's been on TV uh, a lot, but actually the paper is, I was hoping to submit it to final revisions today, but it's got to be done by Monday, uh, nightmare. Um, but yeah, so we've brought together a team of people, all with different expertise, but everyone's been, kind of has the same ethos of curiosity, wanting to get involved, like what isn't exciting about looking inside something that's been hidden for thousands of years. Um, so this interdisciplinary team, but collaboration is really important. Collaboration is exciting. Um, one of the favorite parts of being a scientist is, is, is almost like you can just go hunt down someone with the skills that will be, you know, give you this whole new insight to your project or to these specimens. And so, yeah, it's been brilliant um, to, to bring everyone together. And then serendipity. I mentioned it a few times throughout, but um, being at that event where I chatted to Reese and he was like, oh, yeah, I want to see this, this mummified snake. Um, or Beverly's blog that led to BBC Horizon people getting involved and that that then brought um, Richard from Leicester into the project um, because I probably didn't have enough understanding or confidence to approach a zoo archaeologist at that point to say well we think we've got something interesting um, and that was brought together so the paper will be out super soon um, and then there's a new TV thing as well great inventions so this was a, a TV company approached me to talk about x-rays but one of the most exciting, you know, most of the things I do are engineering, but one of the most exciting and most engaging examples I could talk to them about was the mummified animals. So, you know, I'm using the mummified animals as an example of what you can do in engineering and materials with this technology. So it's, it's been really, really interesting. Um, so, yeah, you can catch some of this on Reese Jones Wildlife Patrol, which Reese will thank me for saying is available on Amazon Prime. Uh, I think, yeah, in the US you can get it, uh, so you can use a VPN. Um, and then Horizon iPlayer, uh, Centimillion Animal Mummies, and you'll see uh, the work of um, Salim Akram and Lydia McKnight as well on that, which is really interesting as experts in the field. Um, oh yeah, and then what else? So Becky, who I mentioned at the start, Becky scanned a uh, suspected falcon that was in a wooden, um, wooden box, effectively, you can see it top left. Uh, so that's another example where we haven't really done anything with the data. We scanned it at the time. Oh, apart from Becky created this 3D printer for the skull, very different to the other one. And then some other mystery packages where we can find, we can see some mandibles of rodents and things like that. So potentially with the time we could interrogate that data too. Um, there's this example as well, which is from the, the samples within Egypt Center. So this is a small, tiny human um, not so much a mummy, but desiccated. Um, and so there's, that's been scanned as well uh, by Becky during her undergraduate studies. So we could potentially look at that. 
Um, but yeah, I think it's, uh, again, referring to the team, but everyone involved, this wouldn't exist without any of them. Um, and it's been really exciting to, to be able to do this. Um, and we've got loads to carry on with and, and get out and tell a bit more of the story. Um, crucial acknowledgement. Uh, so this is my cat. Um, every once in a while, when I was looking at a cat measurement, or I'd be inside the data looking at it on my screen, I just needed almost like a control specimen, and she was always there. Um, she's alive, by the way. Um, and so I just need to put a ruler to her head just every once in a while, just to check how young was this cat compared to my 10-year-old cat. Um, so Heidi definitely gets an acknowledgement because I've had to do this quite a few times in the last seven years, just kind of pop a ruler against the head, which she loves because it's like having head scratches. Um, so yeah, acknowledgement for Heidi. And really important to acknowledge the staff and volunteers of the Egypt Centre. If I could urge everyone to visit the museum once you're able to, I know we're locked down at the moment, but I said I'd refer to this map again. Um, here's the Egypt Centre, based within the university, which is itself within a beautiful green park, but also next to the Gower, which was the first area of outstanding natural beauty in the UK, the famous Mumbles and this sweep of bay. So if you're looking to, if you've limited holidaying in the UK because you don't want to travel, then UK based people, you can go, you can do much worse than coming to Swansea and the Gower and please visit the Egypt Centre. It's a brilliant museum. But also um, there's this, which Ken might uh, refer back to, um, but there's a fundraising campaign at the moment for the Egypt Centre as well to help them succeed. Tons and tons of volunteers putting in time. They do amazing work with uh, children in the region, schools. There's always school groups, or there were before uh, COVID, lots and lots of school groups going in and out, queuing outside the Egypt Centre. Um, it really brings the community into museums, um, which you know, it's really important for some schools where kids won't get to go to museums outside of um, a school trip or things like that. So, yes, um, um, yeah, there's my contact details, but they were throughout. I'll leave that on the screen for when Ken pops back. 